Hey, what's up guys, how's it going? This is Sheldon here from Beat Your Course. Um, today I'm gonna be giving you a, a sample question, uh, one that you're gonna get in your exam, just to give you an idea of what the crash course session is gonna be like if you were to come to this crash course session. Also, I just wanna say that uh, this, this crash course is jam-packed with questions that you're gonna see on your exam, questions like the ones you're gonna see in your exam. There's about 150 pages. Uh, everything that's in your course is in this is in the booklet. It's gonna be reviewed in the crash course. It's 12 hours of review. So if you feel like you're maybe a little bit behind or you feel like you want that extra edge for your exam and you wanna do a bunch of practice problems, then this is the place to be. This is where you're gonna get the, the biggest bang for your buck. And in 12 hours, you, you can't beat it. You can't beat what you're gonna get with uh, Beat Your Course. So please, if you're thinking about that, um, definitely check it out. And uh, this is a good sample to see if you like my teaching style and if you uh, feel like you're gonna benefit from it. So hopefully you really, uh, you drive with that and I would love to see you out, that'd be awesome. So uh, a bit about myself, so uh, as I said, my name is Sheldon and you can call me Mr. Sheldon, that's fine too. Um, and uh, I've been doing math for a long time. I have my undergrad from Carleton. Uh, that's where I got my bachelor's degree in math, straight math, four years of math, and then I did my master's at Waterloo and uh, <clears throat> graduated in 2010. And uh, before that, I, I started doing teaching and tutoring and stuff like that. So. And I've been doing it until now. So I've been doing. I've seen a lot of math. I've seen a lot of different questions. I've seen uh, tons of different exams. I've written probably about ninety exams. So <laughs> I feel like I, I have a good feel, a, a good handle on uh, exams and what you can expect to see on your exams, uh, particularly with this material. Um, so yeah, I hope uh, I hope many of you decide that this will benefit you, and uh, hope to to meet many of you. Okay, so as promised, we're gonna go through a question that you're gonna see, or, or one that you might see, or something like what you might see on the exam. Uh, this is from the curve sketching section. I picked this because I really like curve sketching, um, and I picked this particular question because I found it interesting when I went through it. Um, so I wanted to go through it with you guys and give you a sample of uh, what that might be like in a crash course. So uh, let's take a look at this function. Uh, this is, I'm gonna call this f at x. sine x plus x. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, when you look at one of these functions that you're supposed to be curve sketching, <laughs> you're going to be asked all sorts of things about it. So they, they may ask you specific questions. They may ask you about the critical points or the intercepts or something like that. And when they ask a very specific question, it's easy to find. In this case, the, the question is gives you nothing. It just says, well, the, the, the part above says just graph, just, just sketch the graph. So you have to come up with everything on your own. So the first thing you want to do when you look at something like this is say, do you get anything for free? Are there any freebies? For example, can you tell when the function is equal to zero? Um, can you tell any of the vertical asymptotes? Are there any values that are non-permissible? For example, if I have the function 1 over 1 minus x. In this function, I cannot put in an x value of 1. So automatically, this gives me an as a vertical asymptote. All right. Um, but in this case, we don't really have anything like that. So that's not going to be, that's not going to be the case here. So what we're going to do here is, uh, the first things first, we want to ask ourselves, is there, can we get any zeros from this function? So is there any way we can solve for zero is equal to sine x plus x? Because that will give us a sense where on the graph, if we were to graph it, like here, uh, it'll give us a point, right? It'll give us the zeros if we know where this function is equal to zero. Um, off the top of my head, I, I don't know how to algebraically solve for this, but one thing I do know is if we put in, if we tried f at zero, we're going to get sine of zero plus zero. Oops. Plus zero. And then sine of zero, if you'll remember from whatever special triangles you have or unit circle is just zero. So that whole thing is zero. So just by kind of inspection, we got a freebie on this one. It's not absolutely necessary. If you didn't see that when you were going through it, that's fine. But you want to get as many of these freebies as possible when you're going through and uh, curve sketching just to help your final graph. So I know for sure that I have a zero there. All right. And that's about all I know for zeros for right now. I'm sure there's some special technique to solve for zeros with this, but we don't need to worry about that for right now. We'll be, we'll be able to get all the information we need. Okay. So the next thing <laughs> that I might try is I might try and plug in 2 pi. If you'll notice here, our domain, they've restricted our domain from zero to 2 pi. So there's really, why don't we just plug in 2 pi into the function and see where we're going to end up at the end of our domain. So uh, I'm going to do that here. So f of 2 pi. And what's that going to be? That's going to be sine of 2 pi plus 2 pi. 
And what is sine of 2 pi? Again, uh, from your um, special triangles or unicircle, you'll know that that's zero, right? That's just the, the full period. 2 pi is the full period of sine. So we're back to where we started, which was zero. And then we still have this 2 pi. And so naturally, that's just 2 pi there. Okay, so we end up at the end of our domain, which is here at 2 pi. Uh, we end up at 2 pi. So if we just draw this up like that, I'm going to say that is 2 pi. And I'm just going to draw a little line over there to indicate what's going on 2 pi. There we go. Okay, great. <laughs> and uh, since this is in a video format, um, what I would suggest you do also uh, right about now is maybe pause the video and see what, do your very best at graphing this entire function. So get your critical points, classify your critical points, get your inflection points, classify your inflection points. <laughs> and um, and see what, you, see what you can come up with, okay? And then come back to the video and see what I've done, all right? So uh, now that we've kind of done, we've gotten our freebies, which wasn't much in this question, which is why I really like this question. Let's look at the first derivative, find some critical points, and then see if we can classify those critical points. So f prime at x, what do we get? Well, f at x is up here, right? So if I'm taking the derivative of this, I just need the derivative of sine x, which is you'll remember is cosine x, and then the derivative of x, which is just 1, so plus 1. All right, cool. Um, now, we want to set, to find critical points, we want to set this equal to 0, and then we want to find which x values satisfy that. So let's do that. So let's go 0 is equal to cosine x plus 1. All right, anything we can solve? For? Okay, we can bring this 1 to the other side. So negative 1 is equal to cosine x. And what x value is going to give us a value uh, such that uh, cosine of x is equal to negative 1? This, this only happens at x equals pi in our interval. In our interval from... <coughs> excuse me, 0 to 2 pi, the only solution is when x is equal to pi. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my graph, and I'm just going to draw a line up here at pi, because I know something happens there. All right, the first derivative is equal to 0 right there. And now let's go ahead and classify this critical point. Okay, is that a maximum, is it a minimum, or is it a saddle point? All right, like a saddle point, if you forget, look at something like x cubed. All right, this is x cubed. This is a good example. That's x cubed. What's the derivative? The derivative of that is 3x squared. Uh, when is this equal to 0? That's equal to 0 at 0, right? So there's a critical point at 0. But is there a maximum or a minimum at 0? No, there's not. That's a saddle point, OK? So just because the, critical, there's, just because the first derivative is equal to 0 does not imply that you have a maximum or a minimum. You can have a saddle point. <coughs> so. Um, and in this case, I think we might have something like that. And here's, what, here's what's tipping me off about that. If I look at this function, think about um, what's the smallest that can be for all x values. Well, this 1 is always staying the same. It's just the cosine that's switching around. And it, it, it switches from 1 to negative 1. But it has to stay within 1 and negative 1. So the smallest this thing is going to be is 0. And then it, every other value is going to be positive. All right, so we actually have a zero slope at x equals pi, but then the function is increasing everywhere else. So f prime at x is greater than zero um, for x not equal to pi. That's a pretty big tip, okay? Because that means that our function is always increasing on this entire interval. <coughs> so it starts here at the origin, it ends up there, it's gonna be increasing the whole time, and it flatlines right about there is where it's going to flatline. So <coughs> from here, we can kind of put together what we might expect. The, you know, we can make a guess at what the graph is going to be like. I think it's going to go like this, flatline, and then go up like this. <coughs> That's you know, the reasonable guess for the information that we have so far. of a critical point at pi, and then those starting and ending points there, and the fact that it's increasing the entire way through. <coughs> OK. So uh, that's great. So we found a critical point and we've classified that critical point. So now what we should do is just double check that this is the right graph by taking the second derivative and looking at, see if we can generate any inflection points. Now, from our guess, we might expect an inflection point to be right here at x equals pi, right? Because you can see this is a concave, this is concave down here, and then it looks like it switches here maybe and goes to concave up. 
Okay, so let's check and confirm that this guess makes sense. F double prime of x is equal to, so now we need the derivative of cosine, so we're looking at, I'm, I'm taking the derivative of this function now. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of x, and then plus zero. Uh, so we set this equal to zero, negative sine of x. <coughs> and so which x values make this statement true? Well, x equals zero works, uh, x equals two pi works also. Um, all right, does that make sense? So when x is zero, this, this statement is satisfied. And then when x is equal to two pi, this statement is satisfied also. Um, sorry, when x is equal to pi, that's a mistake. When x is equal to pi, then sine will be zero at, at zero, at pi, at two pi, and so on and so forth. Okay, so now let's classify what happens when x gets to pi. So was the first derivative positive before x equals pi or negative before x equals pi? And if you recall, sine of x is going to be positive. So sine of x is greater than 0 for x between pi, between 0 and pi. All right, so this is negative. We have the negative of that. So this one's going to be less than 0. So this one, which is the negative of this one, has to be less than 0. Just because this one's greater than 0, so the negative has to be less than 0. So the double prime is less than 0 for uh, x between 0 and pi. <coughs> and then sine switches after pi. So from pi, um, I'll write it down here. So sine of x is actually less than 0 as long as you have uh, x is between pi and 2 pi. So in this case, our function, since our function is just the negative of sine of x, our second derivative is going to be have the opposite of that. It's going to be greater than 0 for x between pi and 2 pi. All right, what does that mean? So these are the hints that I, uh, not the hints, the information we've gathered. So this means that the function, our function, we expect it to be concave down for x between 0 and pi, and then concave up for x between pi and 2 pi. That means for sure that we had an inflection point, by the way, because concavity changed, right? Um, remember that a second derivative being 0 does not imply that you have an inflection point. And an example of that is if you look at the function g of x is equal to x to the 4. If we look at the second derivative of that, here's the first derivative, 4x cubed. And then uh, let's go up here. Oops. The second derivative, g double prime of x, is 12x squared. Uh, when does this equal 0? Uh, second derivative of x equals 0 when x equals 0. So uh, you might think there's an inflection point there, but if you know the graph of uh, x to the 4, it just looks like a parabola that's kind of bent out of shape a little bit. And there's no inflection point there. There's no change in concavity. So inflection point is change in concavity. <coughs> so that's why we had to check that the, that the second derivative was less than 0 and then greater than 0 after that inflection point. That means that the concavity has switched, and that implies that you have an inflection point. OK, so let's keep going. I'm just going to erase this. See you later. OK, so let's go back to our graph and see what that implies. So we, we've determined that there is for sure an inflection point at x equals pi, and uh, that agrees with what we had as our, as our original sketch. So we can, we can sketch the, a line there and feel confident that that's what the graph looks like between x equals 0 and x equals 2 pi. And the last thing I want to say about this one is that it actually makes some sense if you were to graph the line y equals x right in there. Because if you look at this, sine x plus x it's just the function x, and you, you're adding in this sine of x, right? So notice that from 0 to pi, sine is positive, and you're adding that little bit. And then at pi, sine is 0, so you're adding nothing. So you're right on that line, y equals x. And then from pi to 2 pi, sine is negative, so you're a little bit below that line, y equals x. So you're kind of hugging that line. And if you went on, if you kept going on, this function would keep hugging that line of y equals x and just kind of oscillating around it. 
like that. And I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, yeah, that's a good example that uh, you'd be expected to know for your exam. Uh, all the concavity, definitely um, the critical points. And um, yeah, I hope that really helps. Okay, in this question, you're gonna use your intuition on derivatives. And you're gonna graph, um, given this graph here, this, uh, this red graph, we wanna graph its derivative and then its second derivative as well. So let's do that. So what I, I highly suggest that you do for this one is you make the graph right underneath, directly underneath. <laughs> Why? Because the critical points of the of the of the top graph, like right up here, you want that to line up directly below on your graph, and we'll see exactly why. And also the inflection point, the inflection point of this first point is going to be important. It's about there, right? It's not exactly there, but it's about there. And we're going to bring that down as well with a little with a little uh, line, so we can see it later. That'll be important on our second derivative. Okay, but first things first, what do we know? We know that this is a critical point right up here. It's a maximum, right? So the derivative at that critical point is zero. So if this is, this is our function f at x, let's say, right here, and then this is f prime at x over here. <coughs> so we expect that the critical point of f at x, this guy up here, has a value of zero on the derivative function. It better, right? Because that's what a critical point means. Now, how the heck do we draw the rest of the graph? Okay, look at the slopes here. In this section, what do the slopes of the tangent lines look like? What, do they have positive slope or negative slope? Okay, you can pause the video for a second now and just try and answer that question. Do you think this function is gonna, the derivative function is gonna come down like that or do you think it's gonna come up like that? Okay, so to pause right now and uh, answer that. <coughs> All right, if you're back now, Let's look at the slopes here. I'm just gonna put a tangent line right here, just to check it out. Okay, there's an approximate tangent line. It's not exact, but it's approximate. Is that a very, very big slope or a very, very small slope? A very negative slope or a very positive slope? And the answer is, it's a very positive slope. That's super steep. So that means our derivative has to have very positive values coming up to this critical point here. All the slopes, even like here, the tangent line is still positive. It's getting less positive and then less positive, and then closer and closer to zero eventually. See that? So eventually it gets to zero, but it's starting very, very positive, and then gets close to zero. So that's what our derivative is gonna do. It's gonna start very, very positive, and then come down to zero like that. All right, that's the first chunk. <coughs> then what's happening to the tangent lines here? Here's a tangent line right there, maybe. Right, see, they're negative now. They're all, they're, they're, all of them are negative, actually for the rest of the time. All of the tangent lines, it doesn't matter what point you pick, you could pick this point if you want. It's more shallow here, but it's still negative. So we know that all of them are now negative. All the derivative values. So where is it most negative? That's the next question. So we know this on the derivative function, we know we're gonna live down here somewhere, right? Because the slopes of all the tangent lines are all less than zero. So we know we're living down there somewhere, but how? How do we draw that? the rest of that function? Well, let's take a peek. Where is this most negative? On this top function, this, the tangent lines here are getting more and more negative up to about there. That's probably the most negative point. <coughs> and what do you kind of recognize? Well, that's the inflection point. That's when the slopes stop getting smaller. Okay, concave down means, another way you can think of concave down is the slopes are getting, they're decreasing, they're getting smaller and smaller. At the inflection point, that's where it stops. It goes concave down to concave up. So the slopes stop getting smaller and they start getting greater, which means the slopes are at their smallest value right there, right at the inflection point. So it should go like that. And then what's happening, they're getting more and more shallow. After that, in our original function up here, the slopes are getting more and more shallow and getting closer and closer to zero. So that's why I know it's gonna go like this, like that. <coughs> All right, that's a little subtlety, is picking out the inflection point of the first function and making that a critical point of your first derivative. All right, so now we have a, we have a general idea of what this first derivative looks like. Let's try and graph its derivative. Now, if you can do the process once, you should be able to do the process again. And that's what we're gonna do. So just right below again, here's f double prime. Uh, and you can kind of, some of these lines are really good to have because you just keep, and this is another reason why you want to put the graphs right on top of each other like that. 
because you can just draw that line down. And that's notice that here, that's the critical point. If I'm taking the derivative of this function, that one is the critical point. So that's where we have to go through the x-axis right there. <coughs> and then we do the same song and dance as we ask on, on this function f at x, what's happening to the tangent lines as we're approaching, here's one tangent line, I can make another tangent line here. What's happening to the tangent lines as we approach our critical point? What do they start as? Do they start really steep, really small, or whatever? And then what do they end up as? So I think if I look at this tangent line right here, that's very, very negative. And the further out I go, it gets more and more negative, like that one. See, it gets even more and more negative. So it starts really, really negative, and then slowly comes up to around here-ish, and then finally the critical point, where these ones are much more shallow. See, these tangent lines are much more shallow, which means their slopes are approaching zero. They started really negative, like negative a billion or whatever, like if you go far enough away, and then they're slowly approaching zero. So I know that this function on my derivative is gonna come like this. See, this one here starts really negative, and then it slowly, slowly increases up to zero. And that's what we want. <coughs> okay, and what happens after? What happens to the slopes after this critical point here? Well, they're starting to get positive, right? It doesn't matter where you pick anymore. They're positive. All of them are positive forever. So we know we're going to come and live up here on our derivative, as per usual. But how? How exactly up there? Now, let's just take a second to find the steepest point there. See where it changes? I'm looking at this. It's concave down there. And then it finally switches here to about concave up. That's what I'm looking at. So that point where it switches from concave, sorry, concave up to concave down, that's the inflection point. So I'm gonna draw a line down like that. <coughs> Why is it significant? It's significant because the slopes of the tangent, tangent lines are steepest right there, right there at that inflection point, and then they get closer and closer to zero. And what does that mean in terms of our derivatives? If the slopes are steepest there, that means that that's where we achieve a maximum for our derivative. Boom, like that. And then from that point on, the slopes are getting closer and closer to zero. They're decreasing closer and closer to zero. So we're going to go like that. Just like that. So if you start with this function here, the first derivative looks like that, and the second derivative looks like that. To recap, I highly suggest that you draw these dotted lines down that are going to help you keep everything um, nice and tidy and organized. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good practice problem that you uh, could expect to see on your test for sure. Okay, in this question, we're asked to sketch a graph of the antiderivative of the following functions. So not the derivative, but the antiderivative. So things are switched up a little bit here, <coughs> given this information that f at zero is equal to zero. Okay, so as usual, whenever you're graphing a derivative or an antiderivative, I highly, highly, highly suggest that you make this graph right underneath, if possible, if you've got the space, so that you can keep everything lined up as we did before. Okay, we get this freebie that f at 0 is equal to 0. So anytime we get a freebie in curve sketching, let's take it. Let's just put our point there. We know that's going to go there. <coughs> now, what we, we can label this graph. This is, this is really like f prime at x. That's what this rep, red graph is. And we're looking for f at x. We're going backwards. Usually we start at f at x and we go to find f prime at x. But in this case, no. They've asked us to sketch the antiderivative. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so uh, what do we know? Well, we know when the derivative is equal to zero, so it looks like at one, at zero, and at three, we know that those represent critical points on the original function. So what I'm gonna do is just draw these lines down as usual. There's already one at the y-axis here, so I don't need to draw one there, and then one here. Because I know at those points, we're gonna have a critical point on our original function f at x. There's going to be critical points where these dotted lines are somewhere, but I don't know where yet. We're going to have to do a little bit of analysis. So the first analysis is that if we look at what's happening to the derivative here as we're approaching, okay, they're all negative. They're very negative, and then it's going up to zero. That means that our original function, the slopes have to be negative <coughs> going up to zero there. And then after this critical point, 
the slopes are positive. See how this first derivative is above the x-axis? That means it's positive there, which means the slopes are positive after that. So what we have is we have something like this. The slopes have to be negative, and then they get to zero. See the slopes up on this, on this function here, they're negative, and then they come up to zero. So on our, our graph here, the slopes are negative. If I drew a tangent line there, it's very, very negative. Okay, and then if I draw a tangent line that's getting closer here, see how it's getting more shallow, closer to zero? That's good. That's what I want. <coughs> okay, and at this dotted line, it's actually equal to zero. The tangent line right there is perfectly flat. And then what happens after? The slopes, if I look back up at this original graph, the slopes go up to there. Okay, so that's when they're, they're steepest. Okay, cool. So here we have a positive slope, and then they're getting down to zero again. So we go, and we have to create another flat point here, okay? Because that's what our that's what our derivative said. Let me just redraw that line there. Our our first, oh, sorry, our, yeah, our derivative function. The slopes are positive here, and then they go back down to zero again. See that they go back down to zero again. So that means we have to have another critical point there. Okay, so there we go. There's a critical point there. And let's just check. Okay, on the original, or on F prime up here, the slopes then get negative again. See how after this X equals zero, the slopes come and they're, they're all in this negative land. All right, so what I expect to see is that these slopes on my original function are all into negative land. And they keep getting negative, more and more negative, until here. Okay, so that's another waypoint. That's the when they reach their most negative point. When the slopes meet, reach their most negative point there. And then they turn around and they stop getting so negative and they go back to zero there. Okay? And then they turn up and go positive here. You can see that the slopes here are all all positive values. So on our graph they're going to they're going to shift up there like that. Okay, now <coughs> this is obviously not that well drawn. It's just a rough sketch. So here it should be concave down, and then here it switches to concave up. And uh, let's do a quick check, so if this makes sense. So what's, what's the degree of this function here? This function here looks like it's a cubic, or degree three. It's x cubed, something with x cubes, right? Because it does this classic x cubed shape. Now, what do we expect our original function to be? If that one's degree three, then the one we started with had to be degree four. And that's actually, this is a, you know, it doesn't, it does look like a degree four actually. Okay, that's a degree four there. So that that's good. That's a good way to check if you've um, got the right function. If you get something that's degree five or degree two or something like that, you might think that you got a problem or certainly a linear thing. Okay, so that's a that's a way you can, uh, you can sketch the antiderivative given a function. I really hope that helps. Use implicit differentiation to find the derivative of y equals arcsine of x. Hint, note that sine y, sine y is equal to x, differentiate and make a triangle. All right, so why do they say sine y is equal to x? Uh, if you start with y is equal to arcsine x, that actually means that sine of y is equal to x. You just get that for free, okay? And uh, we should use that hint, that's a really good idea. So let's start with that. Let's start with sine of y is equal to x. It's an x there. And let's take the derivative of both sides. So we're going to differentiate, differentiate with respect to x. So when we take the derivative of sine of y, we get cosine y. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of y. So that's times y prime. Equals the derivative of x is just equal to 1. So that's fine. And now we can isolate for y prime, because that's what we're looking for, after all. We are looking for, they said, use implicit differentiation to find the derivative of y equals whatever, some function. So we are looking for y prime. Okay, from here, uh, we would really like to have it in terms of x. This thing here that we have, that's in terms of y. We don't really want that. We'd, we'd much prefer to have it in terms of x. And that's what they want, more importantly. That's what they're looking for. So uh, what can we do here? Well, we can use the Pythagorean identity. So we get in trig this identity you get to use whenever you want. 
you get to use that identity. So why don't we see if we can solve for cosine. 1 minus sine squared of y, and then take the square root of both sides. So cosine of y is equal to the square root of 1 minus sine squared y. Okay, so there, that's perfect because we've, well, we're a little bit closer. We've expressed cosine in terms of this weird thing here, okay, which we're really close to uh, an answer. Now, what, what we can use here is, remember this thing here? Remember what we started with? That sine of y is equal to x? Well, here we have a sine squared of y, so that's just an x squared. I'll rewrite it, though, so you can see it more clearly. So this would be 1 minus sine of y squared. Oops. Remember that when you have this notation with this, this squared here, what that means is it just means all of sine of y squared, like I have down here. So I didn't actually do any math from this step to this step. I just wrote it in a different form, just in case you didn't notice that this squared actually applies to the whole thing out there. Which makes it easy to see that up here, sine y is equal to x, so I can just replace that sine y with an x squared. Awesome. So now cosine of y is defined in terms of only x. So let's make that substitution back in there. Because remember we had y prime. If we look back up here, I'm going to rewrite that one. y prime is equal to 1 over cosine y. Oh yeah? Well, let's get that in terms of x. That's 1 over, and let's replace what we have. 1 minus x squared, square root of all that. And you'll notice that that matches up perfectly with our derivative of arcsine. Right, from our formula sheet. If you look in your formula sheet, that's exactly what it is. Okay, and so I would really encourage you to know this, to know um, how to solve this this question. I've seen it on a few sample um, exams already, so I would definitely know how to do it. The other reason I would I would know how to do that is because if you forget on the test, it, does arc the derivative of arc sine have a negative or not here? Remember, the other one has the negative. The derivative of arc cos has the negative. If you forget, you can just derive it. You can just do it quickly. And then you can see, oh yeah, arc sine is, is positive. Arc sine is the positive one. And then arc cosine would be the negative one. So give it a shot with, <clears throat> with arc cosine. See if you can do it with arc cosine and maybe even arc tan and see what you come up with. And um, follow, this, follow this process for sure. And I think you're, uh, you're going to get it. I really hope that that, uh, that helped you guys out. Um, whether you're coming to the beat your course, crash course or not, I hope that you gained something from this. Um, I want you to know that we put a lot of time and work into this review package, this exam review package, and it is full of everything you're going to need to know for your final. Um, it's 12 hours of instruction. It's the best deal you're going to get. I really hope to see a lot of you out there. If I don't see you out there, that's fine. I would still hope this helped, but I would really love to see you out there. So please come check it out and uh, good luck on your exams.